Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the life of Elijah the prophet. We're in chapter 19, and I'm going to read the entire passage, verses 1 through 18, but you remember last week, previous lesson, Elijah met the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He challenged them, and the Lord answered his prayer. He rained down fire from heaven onto Elijah's altar. He defeated the prophets of Baal, took them down to the brook Kishon, and slaughtered all 450. Then he prayed for rain, and the rain came. The drought ended, and he raced ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the gates of Jezreel. And that's where we come in verse 1 of chapter 19. Now, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with his sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a baked cake, baked a bread cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time, and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and, my, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehaloah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about 
The one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu, shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Fifty years ago, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book titled, He is There and He is Not Silent. The title itself states two important facts. God exists and He's personal. He speaks to us. Life is not only biological and material. The universe is not just a big machine that will someday grind to a halt. The future is not deadness and darkness. God is. He's always been and always will be. He is the creator and sustainer of all things, and He has a plan for His universe. We know that because He has spoken. God revealed Himself to His prophets and apostles. There are no prophets and apostles today. The canon of Scripture is closed, but God is still speaking. How He is speaking today is the question that many have. We get an answer from the way He revealed Himself to Elijah when He passed by him in a still, small voice. The voice came to the prophet at a low point in his life when he was in great need of a word from the Lord. But that's one of the surprising things of 1 Kings chapter 19. We would have thought Elijah never had a low point. Everything we've seen of him has been bold and brave, a man of great faith and courage. After the fire of the Lord fell on Mount Carmel and just before the rain fell on the land, Ahab raced home in his chariot with Elijah running before him to the gates of Jezreel. Ahab's queen, Jezebel, was there waiting for him for news of what had happened. The summer palace was in the valley below Mount Carmel. It's not impossible that Jezebel had been able to see fire from, on the mountain from the palace where she was. And if so, she must have thought that Baal answered with a lightning bolt and won the contest. If so, she was unprepared for the news they had brought. Fire fell, but it was Yahweh's fire and all her priests of Baal, all 450 of them, had been slaughtered by Elijah. She didn't take the news well. Elijah was still in the neighborhood and likely also waiting for news, thinking that the Lord's answers to his prayers with fire and rain would result in a great revival and the palace, like the people, would bow down and confess the Lord, He is God. That expectation would help explain His response when Jezebel's messenger arrived with her letter vowing to kill Him as He killed her prophets. May the gods do to me and even more if I do not, she said. He was disappointed. He was disillusioned. There was no revival after all. Baal worship would continue to be the state religion just as it had been before he began prophesying, before he began his ministry. He had failed. And now the queen was coming to cut him up into little pieces. He was terrified and wasted no time. He got up and ran for his life all the way down to the southernmost city of Judah, Beersheba. There he left his servant, suggesting that Elijah thought his ministry was over. And since it was over, there's no need for a servant any longer. And then 
he'd left the land where he had been called to serve in Israel. Now he's down in Judah, and he goes further south, verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. What had happened? As I said, this is one of the surprises of the chapter. Elijah had been unflappable in the face of danger. He had confronted King Ahab without fear for his life. He had been on the mountain alone, outnumbered by the enemy, 450 to 1. He had prayed with confidence for fire and for rain and had seen God answer his prayers. He had experienced God's provision during the famine and experienced God's provision in miraculous ways with ravens feeding him bread and then the widow's bowl never running out of oil. He had prayed for a dead child and raised him up by God's almighty power. He had been a faithful, fearless servant of the Lord and the Lord had never failed him. So we would have expected Elijah to have received Jezebel's letter without concern, maybe even some amusement, and walked into the palace and said, you want to see me? Instead, he became weaker than water, concluded that his ministry was a complete failure, lost all hope, became afraid and ran for his life, and even asked God to end his life. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Evidently, they too were faithless and failures. What happened? One commentator offered the possibilities of fatigue, lack of faith, or a sense of resignation at the prospect of never having peace. And I suppose any one of those or all three of them are possibilities. Fatigue is frequently the reason offered by writers. Charles Spurgeon, for example, is one. In his sermon on this passage, he said, When we pass through great excitement of high joy, there almost always comes following or corresponding reaction and depression. Emotional peaks are often followed by emotional valleys. Elijah had literally been on the peak. He'd been on the mountaintop, brought down fire from heaven, slaughtered pagan prophets, and run for miles from Carmel to Jezreel. So the valley, Spurgeon said, was to be expected. Spurgeon had experience from his own life with depression. Others have as well. Great men. Martin Luther, he called it his blitzkrieg. Winston Churchill called it his black dog. Spurgeon called it fainting fits. In fact, there's a chapter in his book, Lectures to My Students, titled The Minister's Fainting Fits. And he gives different causes and precautions and cures for depression. One cause is He said, a long stretch of unbroken labor. That's not a a cause unique to ministers. This can be for anyone, a problem for those who overwork, uh, and uh, they can come into this condition, he says. So he spoke of, uh, of holy inaction and consecrated leisure. I like that very much. And he supported that from the law of Moses and the Sabbath, which gives rest not only to people, but to animals and even to the ground, which obviously suggests that rest is good and necessary. But he also supported that necessity of holy inaction from the Lord's life when in Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, the Lord took his disciples away from the crowds to a secluded place for rest. In his sermon, Spurgeon spoke of the mind operating on the body and how it can 
like how it, it can string the bow too tightly, and if the string is not relaxed, there is the danger of breaking altogether. And that, Spurgeon thought, was what happened to Elijah. The excitement and fatigue all conspired against him and resulted in his breakdown. That's conjecture on his part. It's reasonable. What follows may seem to support that. But it seems to me God did not overwork his prophet. And certainly in all of this, what we do see is a simple failure of faith. When Elijah got Jezebel's letter, he didn't open it up before the Lord and make the danger known. He didn't pray for protection or direction. He simply took off and headed south. He didn't seem to have a plan. He just ran for his life. What plan he had, if any, was to put as much daylight between himself and Jezebel. So he ran. What would have happened if he had gotten down on his knees or put his head between his knees as he did on Mount Carmel and sought the Lord, the only God who is and who sends fire and rain? I don't want to be glib. I don't want to be simplistic about this. It's no doubt a scary thing to have a person of power like Jezebel threaten your life. And she was powerful. Ahab was the man who ruled Israel, but Jezebel ruled Ahab. She was the power behind the throne. A powerful person, and she meant business. She meant to bring Elijah to a bloody end. That would put fear in anyone. Maybe almost like having the IRS send you a letter and say, please come meet with us. But still, God's people walk by faith. And that means trusting the Lord, looking to Him, and, and acting in obedience, doing what is right. Elijah failed in all of that, which the best of men sometimes do. This is real life, the way it is, which is why there is a lesson in this for us. The, the greatness of this great prophet is not found in himself, but in the Lord God. Elijah was completely dependent on the Lord. Up to this point, it seemed Elijah was invincible. He withstood every storm, was up to every challenge. He mocked his enemies and beat them. It's easy to think Elijah is not like us. He's Superman. Then this happens. What he anticipated happening didn't happen. He's disappointed at the results of his ministry, fearful of the queen's threats, runs away. He, he thought that he, it was, it was, he was the only man of faith left. It was Elijah against the world. And that is a discouraging thing, a discouraging way to look at life. And then he sits down under a juniper tree and asks the Lord to take his life. So James wrote, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And there's a lot of consolation in that. This is a man we can identify with, a man we can learn from, from his success and from his failure. And that's a, a fact with a lot of value, I think. We can learn the dangers and pitfalls from Elijah's mistakes, and we can know how to to be cautious and avoid them. But in our therapeutic age, it's tempting to focus mainly on that and miss the real lesson, which isn't Elijah's psychology and problems, but the Lord's person and how he reveals himself and communicates to us. Elijah's failure, as serious as it is, really serves as background as an occasion to show what God does and who He is. In fact, we learn something of that here in the Lord's response to His desperate prayer. He has answered all of Elijah's prayers. His, 
his prayer for the life of a child, his prayer for fire and rain. But to this prayer, O oh Lord, take my life, he says, no, I won't answer that. He doesn't answer selfish, foolish, harmful prayers. He gives to his children only what is good and helpful, helpful for them. What he does is answer the cry that lies behind this prayer of despair, which is, oh, Lord, help me. That he will do, which reveals his great mercy, which he gives to all of his people. And as I said, we see that here beginning with verse 5. Notice how gently he deals with his prophet. He sends an angel to him. The angel didn't tell him to get up and then when he did, grab his lapels and shake him and say, act like a man. What are you doing here? Get back to Jezreel. Just the opposite. Elijah fell asleep under the juniper tree and we read, behold... There was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The Lord dealt with him in his weakness. He knew what Elijah needed. After that hasty retreat, he needed rest and nourishment. Elijah was off course, but still the Lord took care of him. It's an example of what David wrote in Psalm 103, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. So as a father has compassion on his children, the Lord has compassion on us. He had compassion on Elijah and more, he wasn't finished with him. He gives direction to his escape, and he turns this really journey of unbelief into one of faith and, and spiritual education when he tells him to keep going south. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength that the food, in the, the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. In the Bible, mountains are places where God reveals himself, and this was a special mountain of divine revelation. Horeb is Mount Sinai, and there the Lord revealed himself again to his prophet in order to lead him out of his doubt and despair, to strengthen his faith. And again, he was kind and merciful in his way of dealing with Elijah. He begins with a question. He asks, what are you doing here, Elijah? What was the, what was the prophet doing out of his field of ministry? What the Lord is doing here in asking this question is to get him to thinking about these things, to get his mind in the, going in the right direction. And in verse 10, Elijah was quick to answer. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah was disillusioned. He had zeal. He did miracles on Mount Carmel. But it didn't produce revival in Israel. It seemed a complete failure to him. He couldn't reconcile his ideas of God and his ideas of what God was doing and what he expected to happen with what did happen. So the Lord now shows Elijah why he had brought him all the way down to this special mountain. He instructed him to go outside his cave and stand before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. It was an, an impressive event. First, there was a terrifying wind that broke the rocks in pieces. Then there was an earthquake that shook the mountain. 
After that, a, a terrifying fire swept by. But the Lord was not in any of these great displays of power. But then there was a sound of a gentle blowing. The King James Version has a still small voice. The Hebrew is a, a small whisper of a voice, a thin sound, barely heard or felt. That's where the Lord is. He reveals Himself in a voice that is like a refre refreshing, calming breeze. What was this teaching? It represents the quiet work of God's grace. That's how the Lord works, to produce great change in people. Wind and fire can inspire dread and awe and reverence in people, but they don't give faith. When Moses was on that same mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, it smoked and quaked. It terrified the people. But after they experienced all of that, they worshipped a golden calf. Miracles don't convert people. Ahab saw fire on Mount Carmel. He saw rain in the Jezreel Valley. He didn't believe. Jezebel heard about the miracles. She didn't believe. In fact, they strengthened their unbelief. God did a great work through His miracles. He prepares the soil, as it were. He breaks up the fallow ground, so to speak, with mighty works. Just as He prepares the heart with the, the threatenings of the law. But it is His quiet work of grace in the secret place of the soul that melts the cold heart and causes conversion. That's God's glory. He said that to Moses on that very mountain where Elijah stood. Eli Moses wanted to see the glory of the Lord, and so he said, I'll give you that request. And we read in Exodus 34 of how he showed Moses his glory. He placed him in the cleft of the rock, and then he passed by. It's surprising. We expect to see some magnificent display, sound and light and all of that. And what happens when he passed by, and by the way, it's the same word used here of him passing by Elijah. What he got was the same revelation that he gave to Elijah, that he gave to Moses. The Lord said in Exodus 34, verse 6, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. God called that His glory. We do see glory in various displays of power. God's glory is in all of these things. We see the stars at night, and it's the glory of God. And we can give all kinds of examples of God's great glory and His providence and, and the great wonders of nature. But the great glory of the Lord and His greatest work happens in quiet ways and places, in a small whisper of a voice, in ways that you and I may not even see. The Lord was doing great things in Israel that Elijah did not know. He thought that he was the only man left. It was Elijah against the world. He was in despair over that. When the Lord told him in verse 19 of 7,000 who had not bowed to Baal, these were Israelites, it would seem, who had been influenced by Elijah's ministry. And Elijah didn't know they existed. His influence was wide and more effective than he knew. This is how God works most often, normally. Not with thunder and lightning, shows of power, but quietly in small places and in unspectacular ways to bring people to himself. In his sermon on this passage, Spurgeon gave some examples of that, of how people were brought to the truth in very simple and unexpected and unspectacular ways. In fact, his own conversion is an example of that very thing, of how as a boy on a Sunday morning, the weather forced him to seek refuge in a small primitive Methodist chapel. You know the story. You've heard it, I think, probably many times. 
The preacher was snowed out, so a simple man from the congregation, not a preacher, got up and spoke briefly from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And young Spurgeon did that. He looked to the Lord and was saved. It wasn't eloquence or display of power that worked on him, but the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. That's how He speaks to us today. He will do the same with you as He did in that Methodist chapel using that simple man who simply preached from a, a single text of Scripture. He speaks in a person's soul as you tell them the gospel. Or maybe the Bible itself will speak as it did for Augustine when he sat in a garden in Milan under conviction of sin was sort of at the end of himself when he heard a child singing. Take up and read. Take up and read. And he did. He took up his Bible. He turned to Romans 13, verses 12 through 14. Let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not even a gospel text. But God used it in his soul and he believed. People may read Scripture or hear you give the gospel, but it, in, that, in that voice of yours or in the reading of Scripture, there's another voice in it all, and it is the still, small voice, not actually heard, but the voice of the Holy Spirit calling them. That's irresistible grace. And they come. And it is so in the Christian's life as well. There is a place for divine threats of warnings against sin and disobedience, against getting off the path. Now, fools ignore that to their peril. That's Hebrews chapter 12. He, he disciplines his children. We need to take that seriously. We need to listen to the Lord and his warnings. But it is chiefly through grace and mercy that the Lord works in the lives of his people to give them a desire for obedience and to service out of love and gratitude. We have an obligation. It's, it's certainly true. But the greatest motivation for serving the Lord and living for Him is the gratitude that grace gives us. I love that statement by the Scot, Thomas Erskine. In the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. The Lord's loving kindness moves us to obedience. And the Holy Spirit teaches us that and convinces us of it, stirs us up to zeal and godliness through God's Word. That's where the Holy Spirit works and speaks. So we need to know God's Word. We need to know Scripture in order to know Him. Part of Elijah's problem, maybe fundamental to his problem, was he lacked an understanding of things. He anticipated something he shouldn't have necessarily been anticipating. He felt a discouragement from what he felt was the Lord's failure and his failure. And we will suffer the same kind of weakness of faith if we ourselves are not in the Word of God studying it. The Bible, God's revelation, what is referred to often as propositional truth, is the greatest possession we have. The Holy Spirit speaks to us in it. He nourishes our souls through it. He guides us by that Word in His whisper, His inaudible voice. Romans 8 speaks of this, how He testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. He prays for us with groanings too deep for words. And then the Lord speaks in His providence as well, like uh, acts of kindness and help to others. It's often very simple, but still profound as with Onesiphorus, seeking out Paul in his Roman prison, doing so at great danger to himself, and helping the apostle. 
sacrificing for him. God sent him there, and that act of generosity and kindness on his part was a communication to him of the love of God for him and his care. And, and God can do that in, with, with individuals we would not even consider to be believers. Donald Gray Barnhouse told a story about a, a young boy on a train who was crying. And it went on for some time. We've all been on an airplane and experienced that. Maybe uh, our children have been the cause of it. So after a while, one of the passengers became irritated. And he asked out loud, where is that child's mother? And someone answered, she's in the back car in a coffin. The man was grieved and said, bring him to me. I'll look after him. And he consoled the boy through that sad night. Well, that's the Lord's compassion, whether it's done through a believer or a non-believer, because we're all created in the image of God, and because of that, we do act in such ways. And it reveals God's goodness. He has many ways in His providence of revealing His goodness. He works in strange ways, in ways we might not expect, but He works in the, in the common places of the world, the way He works in providence. He manifests His goodness. He manifests His provision for us, His love and His care for us. And fundamentally, He ministers to us and speaks to us through His Word, through the Scriptures as the Spirit interprets and teaches them to us. Now in verse 13, Elijah responded to the revelation by wrapping his face in a mantle as a, a sign of his humility before the Lord. And the Lord again asked him what he was doing there. And he responded as he had the first time, verse 14. Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now that may surprise us a little because it seems he's been unaffected by the revelation that he was given. He's answering the same way that he answered before. But then we all advance in our faith slowly. Even a prophet advances in his faith slowly. Like that man in, in Mark chapter 9 who said, to the Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. Well, the Lord helped Elijah here in the last verses of our passage, verses 15 through 17. He renewed his mission and, in fact, widened it and now made him an agent of the Lord's justice in dealing with those who rejected his word and threatened his prophet. He was to go to Damascus and anoint anoint Hazael, king of Assyria, or rather king of Syria. He would become a scourge to Israel. Then he was to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. Jehu would kill all who Hazael didn't. Third, he was to anoint Elijah, prophet, to take his place. Elijah would be his follower Elijah would carry on the ministry of Elijah. Those who oppose God in unbelief would be removed, but his work of grace would continue on. He'd continue with the next prophet. God is sovereign over the nation and over the nations. So Elijah could go out in obedience to the Lord with absolute confidence. He does his mighty works quietly through his word in the heart by His irresistible grace and His calling and His leading. He's doing things that you and I don't see. Using the obedient saint in ways that he or she may not even be aware of. 7,000 were believing in the Lord and Elijah had no idea of the fruit that his ministry produced. And you and I have no idea of the, the width of your influence uh, as you are obedient in the field that God has put you in. There is fruit growing there 
you aren't even aware of. Don't quit. Continue in the field and be faithful. Ultimately, of course, it is God's mighty work. He does it through His Word. When we speak the gospel, He calls the sinner. And they come. He speaks to us in His Word and He gives us wisdom and He gives us leading. So we need to have to give attention to His Word. Study the Scriptures. Know the Bible. It's our greatest possession. It is His voice in our hearts. God has done many mighty works. They break up the fallow ground. They can prepare a person for the good news. That happened to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 when an earthquake shook the prison. It shook him to his soul, but didn't save him. It drove him to despair and the verge of suicide. So he cried out to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they answered very simply, believe in the Lord Jesus. He heard that and did that. He believed in Christ and was saved, and so was his whole household when they believed later that same night. That's the power of God. It is in His Word, the Scriptures, which are living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. They bring about change in the soul, and they bring salvation. They bring eternal life. If you're here without Christ, having never believed in Him, as God's eternal Son, as God's Savior for us, our only Savior and great Savior, then you need a real miracle. You need the greatest miracle, the new birth. Look to the Lord. Trust in Him. All who do are forgiven and receive eternal life. Look and be saved. And continue looking to Him daily in His Word, the Scriptures, where and how He speaks to us. May God help all of us to do that. Let's stand and sing from the Songs of Praise book, hymn number 27. I think a hymn very appropriate for this passage. Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart. Hymn number 27. And then remain standing for the benefit that... uh, We are by nature fearful and doubting, but we do have that great assurance that we're engraven on your heart and you'll never forsake us. Give us boldness, Father, for you and may we live lives that bring honor to you and lives devoted to your word where you speak to us. We thank you for your great revelation to us and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.